Welcome to video 5.5, optimization of async methods with value task. In the previous video, we talked about tuples in c 7, which is implemented with a value type. And the result of this is that it doesn't need the GC to free up the tuples once they are not needed. In this video, we will learn about a similar optimization for async methods. First, we will discuss the rules for async methods and their return types since this was changed in c 7. Then we will discuss a new type which can now be returned from an async method. And this new type is called value task. After this video, you will understand what optimization c 7 offers when it comes to async APIs. Now in this video, I won't go into the details of asynchronous programming since we discussed that in section 4. If you are not familiar with that concept, then I highly suggest you to revisit that part from section 4 before you continue this video. Alright, so let's discuss what was possible to return from an async method before c 7. Basically, once you marked a method with the async keyword, then you had three choices. Either you returned a task in case you were not interested in the return value, or you returned task t where t was the type of the return value, or you returned void and this was mainly allowed for backwards compatibility, for example for events. So the point here is, the return type of an async method where you really return something had to be a task t. And guess what? Task and task t are reference types. So you may already know where we are heading. The problem with task and task t in some special edge cases is that they are reference types. This means every time an async method returns, a task is allocated on the heap. So in c 7, this rule was changed Basically, c 7 generalizes the notion of something that is task-like. The official documentation does a great job of explaining what types you can return from an async method, so starting with c 7, you can return everything that has an accessible getAwaiter method. The object returned by the getAwaiter method must implement the system.runtime.compiler services iCritical Notify Completion interface. The common use cases where task and task t were problematic are cases where for example you cache the values in an async API. This is exactly what we have here on the screen. This is a typical asynchronous API with caching in the pre c 7 world. Let's say in a financial application you want to download historical data for different time ranges over HTTP. In this sample, historical data reader reads the data over HTTP and the historical data cache is the local cache. The caller of the API can request the historical data with different time ranges. For example, first it requests the data for the last one year, then for the last three years, and after that for the last two years. In this case, it absolutely makes sense to catch the data because when we have the data for the last three years, we can immediately return the data in the next call for the last two years without doing any HTTP call. So when we return the data from the cache, then from this method we can return synchronously. Unfortunately, before c 7, if you offer an asynchronous API, then in this case you still have to allocate a task and typically this is done with task.fromResult. And if this is in a tight loop and most of the time we have the historical data in the cache, which by the way will be the case after the caller method requests a historical data with a very big time frame, then you always allocate a task object on the heap just to satisfy the asynchronous API. So value task addresses exactly this problem. Here is the code from the last slide with c 7 and value task. So value task is a new type that indeed has a get awaiter method, so you can call this method with the await keyword. Value task was specifically designed to address the allocation issue. It's basically a discriminated union. It's either a task or the result itself that you can return without allocating a task on the heap. This time when the data is already on the cache, we return synchronously as before, but this time we don't allocate a task on the heap because this time we simply use a value task, which is a struct. Now let's see the difference in action. So we have both versions of the get historical data method in this code, one that returns a task and one that returns a value task. As always, I will measure the difference. The caller method will request the historical data of the Microsoft stock. First, it requests the data from 1st of January 1995 
Then in the next iteration, it will request the data from 2nd of January 1995, and this goes on until 1st of January 2017. And we do this for both implementations. Now this time we don't use an HTTP call, we simply read the data from a file. This is still a realistic test since reading the whole file is significantly slower than returning it from the cache. And as you can see, we also read the file asynchronously. The cache in this case is simply a static field, so the async case basically reads from a file and the synchronous case returns the data from a static field. And you probably already realized that we test the optimal case from the cache's point of view since the first code populates the cache and every subsequent call can return the data synchronously from the cache. I already measured this with Benchmark.net and here are the results. As you can see, the value task-based implementation is a little bit faster and the reason for this is related to heap allocations. As you can see, the task-based implementation triggered more GC rounds. But the difference is very small, even in this edge case where we always had a cache hit after the first method call. So now that we know what value task is, let's talk about when you should use it. Now this time I'm going radical and I not only repeat what I always say, I even have a danger sign here for you. So do not use value task unless you measured it and you actually have numbers showing that your async method performs better when it returns a value task. In general, we can say that with scenarios where an async method is called in a tight loop and it can return the result synchronously most of the time, for example due to caching, then value task has potential. But do not use value task by default, in such scenarios I still suggest you to measure the difference. Also the official recommendation of Microsoft is to always use task by default, you should only try value task in performance critical scenarios and you should always measure the difference and make sure that it beats the task based implementation in your specific scenario. The reason for this is that value task also adds additional overhead, for example if the caller of a value task based async method uses task.whenAll or task.whenAny then the value task has to be converted into a task, so in that case you basically have the overhead of both the task and the value task. Plus, if you look into the implementation of value task, then you will see that it contains always two fields and task contains only a single field. Therefore, the default choice still should be task and task T. Alright, let's summarize what we learned in this video. So in C Sharp 7, the possible return types of async methods were generalized and everything that has a getaway term method can be returned from an async method. A new type was also introduced due to this new rule and this is the value task which is a value type. It can boost the performance of async methods in tight loops, especially when the async method returns synchronously. With this new type you can have a single API for both the synchronous and the asynchronous case by returning value task and avoiding heap allocation in the synchronous case. It's important to measure the difference between returning a task and value task in your specific scenario. And finally, by default you should still use tasks. Thanks for watching, in the next video we will discuss the performance characteristics of pattern matching.